Nicola is a Carnegie Scholar and graduate of Dundee University who completed her PhD in 2012. Her thesis on Scottish noble women, the family in Scottish politics, 1688-1707. She currently occupies the post of local history officer based in the AK Bell Library in Perth looking after special collections and genealogy. Her work necessarily involves her in numerous uh, local history projects, including Great War Commemorations, which is how I came to meet her. I know she's particularly intrigued by the work of the 8th Duchess of Arthur, Catherine Ramsay. Uh, she has a wonderful singing voice, and today she's here to tell you more about Gypsy Traveller links within the local area and the role of art in teasing out those connections. Thank you for inviting me along today. Um, my slide, I think, already. Um, a little bit about me. I, Seamus is right, I'm currently working as the local history officer for Culture Perth and Kinross um, here. Uh, but I'm here today kind of as an independent scholar because I do a lot of work on my own. As Seamus says, I'm always at Blair Castle at the archive there. Um, my work does involve all kinds of historical um, projects, local projects, events, exhibitions. I do a lot of exhibition work as well, lots to think about, Rona, thank you. That was a great paper, um, just to, to think about when you're doing these things. Um, and we also support a lot of projects through the library service in conjunction with our colleagues in the museums and galleries. And of course, First World War and memorialisation uh, was when I was first working with Seamus and with David McPhee, um, who, who's going to talk after me, and, and his, his project, which um, some of the, the exhibitions that we created um, and displayed way back 2014, I think, the, the actual beginning, um, of how the Great War had impacted on, on, on gypsy travellers. And that was how I had I met Seamus, and, and, I, and I'm going to put some um, ideas forward today about what we found and how things worked. So, um, yeah, we, we do a little bit of genealogy in libraries. We, um, um, I love to say that we do the Scottish version, I can't your father, not who do you think you are. Um, and we take people through all sorts of things, um, helping them find their, their, fam their own family histories. And, and I'm going to share a little bit about that today. My next slide. Um, I don't have any former knowledge of gypsy traveller art um, or the culture and life experience during the First World War before becoming involved with Seamus's project uh, because my own research has been focused on this woman. She was the first Duchess of Athol um, and it was my thesis on her and my continuing interest in her and her network and family which brings me to Jacobites. Um, I've been doing Jacobite songs and history and all sorts of things and, and it's, it's, quite, um, it's just my continuing interest really in th those things that I'm working on just now. But of course this, this is Catherine, the first Duchess of Athol, and she died in 1707. And it's a later Duchess of Athol who's much more well known, who features here today. And I imagine what you're probably wondering what I can say about a Duchess, gypsy travellers, and how this ties to an idea of hidden treasures. And I, I hope I um, do you justice in trying to say that. So, uh, next slide. Right, here she is. So, while carrying out work at Blair Castle um, Archive, I was actually, as I say, working on a Catherine. She's known as Kitty. This is um, Kitty, just to, to be, uh, I'll call her Kitty from now on. But she was the wife of the eighth Duchess, uh, the eighth Duke. And I was searching in Kitty Athol's papers to explore women's war work in Perth. She was president of the Red Cross in Perth, among other roles, and I hoped her papers might illuminate the work that went on in the building that is now the AK Bell Library. You can see it in this picture here. I love using this picture and getting people to identify it, but it's very strange that that was the Red Cross Hospital. And funnily enough, Kitty's pictures of that have come back to that building, which I think is a wee bit spooky, but there we go. Um, so at the same time, Seamus had been sharing family First World War stories um, and we'd been talking about how gypsy travellers had been affected by the war because mo some of the project work was about how people in Perth had been affected. So I was searching for families and evidence, but actually, given the itinerant nature of these people, I didn't expect to find them. Um, and with a little digging, actually, it was amazing what we did come up with and in unexpected places. So first of all, I'll focus a little bit on family history. Now, one of the key sets of documents we use are births, marriage and death documents, and also, most importantly, the census records. And I'd rather assume that the lifestyle, and in particular the travelling, might have meant that there could be less formal record taking in the past lives of gypsy travellers. Could I be forgiven for thinking that those whose lives are not set in one place and who move regularly for all kinds of reasons might accumulate less by the way of a personal archive 
archive. Uh, the oral tradition is very strong, so again, did family traditions, stories, songs and, and news given in that way all feed into the idea that there was less statutory material um, to find. Now, the image I've used here is of a Helen McPhee. Um, sorry, Seamus, I stuck with the McPhee name. I don't think she's any relation to you, but I just went with that when I was searching. And this is, this is the 1901 census um, in the village of Furness in the parish of Cumlauden. So for my next slide, I'm just going to zoom in on it here. So what can these records tell us? I have to make them bigger for you. But basically, um, what we can see here is that they're living in Kralakin wood furnace in a tent. So I've, I've come across that in the census, and I was like, ah, right, OK. Um, and it's George McPhee as the head of the household with Helen, his wife. Um, and then we get the list of the family members all the way down here. We're seeing who else is in the household, who is a wife. His daughter Mary is a widow. Alexander, James, Helen, Betsy and George. And the last three um, are scholars, but the other jobs are given there too. Tinsmith, um, Hawker, basket maker. So there, there are the people that have created exactly what Rona's talking about, named, and their jobs are actually given and, and, they're, they're, and they're there. So they're there for us to find, which I thought was great. And the last three are scholars, and that comes up because they're all in school. So again, another myth that they, that, and I'll come back to that about the education. So that was great. Um, so I, that, this is what all family historians want to know, this information. I was, I was glad it was here. So there we go. I've also looked up the place um, where it was on the map, because I couldn't quite make out the spelling, and there it is. Kralekin um, is a wood, um, and there is furnace um, on the edge of the or Loch Fine, I think it is. So this is the National Library of Scotland map website, which is brilliant. You can actually do a side-by-side -side view where you look at what's there today and you can go through old maps on this side and see what was there in the past. So this was brilliant. I did a wee bit of that just to see. But there's no, although the village is there, um, I couldn't find, I went through various maps, but I couldn't find evidence of any um, site for, for gypsy travellers. But this, it does help us establish exactly where the, fa the family were. And I can then also as ascertain that the enumerator for that census must have known exactly where to find this family too. So it's, it's local knowledge. It's something that is there and, and it's there in the local memory if it's not there in the maps particularly. He knew to go there. He knew where to find folk. And he lists other people that are living at that stage as well. So I think that that's quite important as well. My next slide. Now, again, libraries and archives are great places to find all kinds of information. And our museums, of course, as well as, as um, Rona said, are, are, are obviously in, in charge of a great deal of um, artefacts. We also have a lot of images. We collect one of our biggest collections is images. We have postcards and um, paintings and sketches and all kinds of things. Uh, and some survive, which depict this kind of lifestyle. And we have some which were collected, obviously, with Seamus when we were doing the First World War. Work. We, we actually invited people to bring their memories and collect and any memorabilia in, so lots of things came up. So it's very common for people tracing family history to have no idea about the town or the place or the homes people lived in, and nor the kind of work they did. We may get people from all over. Um, Scots were, you know, diaspora we're talking, so we get Canadian. This is the, the, the silly season for us in the library. We'll have Canadians one day, New Zealanders, and they're all coming back to find their roots. But when they look at the census and find out that grandfather was a weaver or a labourer or an agriculture labourer, you know, there's not a lot to go on there. So we have to try and find different ways to tell them about, about the period and about what they can find. And images are a great way to do this. Um, these might not be your relatives, they might not be the people that you're looking for, but it gives you a good idea of, of how folk lived and, and that's really important. So this is another McPhee family. I don't think they're related to the last one, I have no idea, but I just went through McPhee, sorry. Um, but this is actually... Um, Another McPhee family, and this is again the 1901 census, and I found these ones in Nig um, on a farm. And again, if we just move into this one, zooming in, um, this is the, the family from that one. We see what his role is again. He's a travelling tinsmith, um, and he's working on his own account. So everybody in the family is, is working, they're self-employed. So that's been recognised as well, which I thought was interesting. But what I thought when I put up Helen, this is the first one that we had here, and the, and the family from the two censuses here, I was looking at where they were all born. And I thought this was interesting too. Now for me it's interesting because I had in my own mind believed that travellers roaming, moving around the countryside, or travelling Scotland from top to bottom. And in truth, these, these records at least are supporting the idea that people are in certain areas, possibly within the confines of a parish or region. Because if we look at the top one, everyone's born in Rosshire. 
Um, they're all born in different places, but they're all saying that they're coming from from Rosher, and in this one we're in Argyll. So there's a kind of a, a there is a, a, a you know a, a connection there with where people are settling themselves in in, a, in although they're they're moving. So that for me again was quite important that we see this borne out in the records that they give that information. Now again, there are other places we can come across our ancestors, and the young man at this time, this is taken from ancestry, this is again just searching kind of randomly, um, but what, what is here is that he's 23 years old, um, and he's in what was then called um, the Royal Lunatic Asylum. So he's not well, um, but he's in Montrose. This, this census record would give you a, a, a very long list of all the patients who are obviously on the night of the census in the hospital. So again, that's another way of finding people, hospitals, um, poor house records, all kinds of things uh, we can find our relatives. The other one here is we hold in our department in the library um, newspapers which date from 1809. And the newspapers are another huge source of, of family information and local information. Now this one is actually um, it's about Pitlochry actually and it's three lads who are in a lot of bother for being disorderly and what happens to them. Um, and it's just a snippet from the paper um, but that, that's, that again um, is, is, is where we can find records and they're not so hidden you just have to know where to look for them now we get a lot of people doing family history who are a bit horrified to find this kind of thing um, we, I've got we've got them all I'm searching for cow meadows in Gloucester I looked for the one I found and then found his brother um, but he was in the debtors prison I thought, oh great that's great um, so they might be in court records there might be accounts in the paper of all kinds of incidents um, as well if you find them in the court, you usually want to go to the paper and check if they wrote up a, a, an actual report about it, which is quite good to have. Prisons, asylums, poor houses. But in fact, if people are horrified by this, always be careful what you wish for when you start searching for your ancestors. But of course, people are a wee bit horrified. But in fact, we ought to be glad our relatives were um, in a bit of bother, because then you can find them. If they're well behaved and they're, and they're, and they're law abiding and they're not in any kind of bother, there's less said about them. And we don't, we don't really want those kind of ancestors. We we want the ones you can find. So um, I always think this is a plus when, whenever you can find them. So for the next one too, now this will tie in with a little bit of what um, Dave is probably going to say. Of course, we were we were studying which regiments gypsy travellers um, enlisted in at the start of the Great War. Uh, the Black Watch is a great regiment for them. But what evidence can we actually find for gypsy traveller men within its ranks? And again, we can find evidence in a variety of ways, most especially with formal military records. So there's another, another place where we can find them. These are medal roll index cards which can be found for many soldiers and I've, I've got a couple of examples here. Private Stuart McPhee, Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders um, and that's his Victory Medal and the British War Medal and the one here is Private George McPhee um, discharged in Nottingham in 1917. So I went on to have a wee look for George because the next two documents relate to him and his being awarded medals is the top one and the second one here is actually George being given the Silver War Badge which was issued in the United Kingdom and throughout the British Empire to service personnel who'd been honourably discharged due to wounds or sickness from military service. Uh, this would allow men to wear a badge basically so that if they were back home in wartime people understood why they, hadn't, they weren't still serving because maybe um, their wounds or whatever weren't obvious to people but it would allow them other people to know that they had served um, and that they weren't um, dodging uh, the conscription or anything. So again I found other ways because further searching meant we also found evidence of these soldiers in books written about the war. The Black Watch History, a three volume by Walkup, is a great book. Soldiers who died in the Great War, other accounts such as On Flows the Tay, but they'll also be found in formal rolls of honour. The Golden Book of Persia where all the war dead for Perth and Kinross have been, have been named. And of course that leads us to the National National War Memorial in Edinburgh and I was at something recently with First World War and we had a talk by some guys from the, the National War Memorial. They're still adding names today. Um, to the That's their job. They're still adding names in. People have come up and said, well, my, my father's not on this list or he's not here and, and that's their job to still add. So again, the opportunity at this point during the memorialisation period to make sure your relatives um, were honoured is, is, is still there. 
Now I'm just going to go back to Kitty here again. Here she is um, as uh, the, 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 the president of the Perthshire branch of the Red Cross. Now Kitty was active in uh, social service and local government in 1912 and she served on a hugely um, influential Highlands and Islands Medical Service Committee. Now this, this committee actually um, wrote a report and, um, and it has been widely credited with creating the forerunner to the National Health Service and she was actually appointed a Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 1918 for this work. It's quite impressive. So it was the the records in the archive at Blair, which referred to her work on the Highlands and Islands Medical Service Committee, which brought to light a great amount of material, which outlines a whole host of things. Now, this is when I was looking for her, her, her war work was in one box, and the next box, I think it's box 21, was all about this committee's work. And I couldn't let that pass. I had to, I had to have a look at it. And then brilliantly it tied in with everything that Seamus had been talking about um, when we were talking about the project. But basically this work with this, the Medical Service Committee um, was a whole host of issues including concerns for welfare of gypsy travellers, their education, the need to settle these communities, big, big debates on creating colonies for them um, and removing their children as an incentive to settle. Some of this was quite distressing and, and the, the discussions are, are all there. Now Kitty chaired this committee and travelled all over Scotland Scotland hearing evidence from large numbers of people about their experiences of what was referred to in this report as the tinker problem. And, and here is Kitty giving a speech from a car while campaigning and all I can say about this woman is that her first and foremost concern was welfare and this was all through her political career. In fact she even lost her seat eventually because it was a welfare issue that she was putting before politics in many ways. She was questioning people on health, she wanted to know about child mortality levels, childhood illness, vaccinations, the care of new mothers, um, she wanted to ensure children were receiving their education and the reports all document exactly Exactly what was said. They're typed up reports so you see who was speaking and what they said as a question and what the answer was. So they're all they're actually there to read as and you can hear, I don't know, I can imagine a big hall with the committee sitting on the top table and people being brought in and asked the questions and things and giving their answers. So it's very it, it's quite when you read it you hear the voices. You can see her concerns coming through. You can also see that some people were hugely pro prejudiced towards the gypsy traveller and the lifestyle. And then others were actually um, quite supportive. We got repeated reports um, coming through on disorderly behaviour, any drunken behaviour, and complaints generally which centre on the itinerant nature of the lifestyle. But in response, there was a great deal on farmers relying on these workers, landowners providing homes and land if necessary, and some people who were happy to live quite peaceably alongside a group of people who wish to travel. Now, I, I could do a whole hour on what's in these reports because it's quite fascinating stuff and there's a massive box of, of reports and things. There's, really, there's almost a thesis in itself to be written in it. But one of the wartime issues was that women who were entitled to receive the separation allowance, um, this is a benefit basically because their husbands were fighting, um, they had to live in a town address. And this meant that gypsy traveller women were moved into Thimble Row in Perth. Now, this document here, again, is, is, is giving us a list of names of women who were going to be moved into Thimble Row. Um, and again, there's, there are trade directories in, in our library where names of people who live there are actually um, can be found. So this shows the, that we're given this accommodation. Um, and again, we're actually finding them in the records. Sometimes when you go to the Thimble Row um, in the trade directory, you can't find these names, but they're actually in these re le le um, records. So again, they're, they're not so hidden as we might think. Now, moving the women into this part of Perth actually was problematic. For one thing, the women didn't really want to go. Um, the conditions were not good. Thimble Row is not the, the nicest of areas in Perth. And many women um, didn't want to stay. Crucially, they also lacked opportunities for work. So they really are, they're really not comfortable in this accommodation. However, ladies from Perth committees gave reports um, and they tried to visit them and encourage women to stay um, and, and, and ensure that they got the benefit that everybody else was getting of the separation allowance. But it was hard for them to adapt to town living. And I think this report here, um, do a number of them keep their houses clean and tidy? Yes, fairly decent. Do you think they appreciate the difference between a dwelling home and a tent? The answer, I'm not sure they do. Their inclination is to be in the open country and they invariably express themselves as preferring to be in the country, particularly in summer. So somebody there in the report is acknowledging it's just not what they want. It's just not, it's not what they're, they're about. So that's how the reports look as well. They're all typed up like that and, and you can read through them. 
in the next one, this question is this person is being questioned, and he's asked about the war effort. And again, um, I'm quite surprised at this one. Are you surprised to know that there are, I think it's 308 tinkers in the army dealing with the whole of Scotland? I did not know there were so many. This is somebody living at the same time. How, how could he not know that? Should something be done to try and help these men to settle down if they're inclined when they come back? The best thing would be offer them all encouragement to remain in the army. And this was one of their um, thoughts that, in fact, that if gypsy travellers had been in the army, and um, this was feeding into a big debate, um, they thought that army life would have a positive effect on the men because they were conforming and working and living within a regiment. And this could be a factor for helping people settle into settled living when the men returned. But, of course, um, what to do with all returning soldiers um, would become a universal problem um, and not just one concerning one particular community. Now, just to finish up with this letter here, included in the reports too, was a response to a Dr Ferguson making inquiries in a circular letter about the tinker. So this person's responding to Dr Ferguson and he's saying, I hope your committee will not try to force the poor tinkers off the road or out of existence, but rather to give them a larger place, greater facilities for developing into useful, industrious members of society along their own lines. So here's somebody who is supportive and didn't wish to see the lifestyle eradicated, but wanted them supported in, in different ways and that feeds, feeds into the colony um, art which again is there's a big feature in all of this about giving land and not moving people into towns and doing different things which um, which is it, again there's loads more to explore there so basically in a nutshell I began researching believing I would struggle to find records and material evidence I thought these things would be hidden but for those with ancestors in the gypsy traveler community um, and in fact as I hope I've shown today the evidence uh, is there. Um, the stories can be found, the names, the details, um, they live on in written records and it's a case of knowing where to look. Finding gems such as the work of Kitty, the Duchess of Athol, all of that work is, is sitting in a box in Blair Castle. It's there for people to go and ask to see um, and I think that's quite amazing and if we, if we actually know where to look and if we think about more about that we can expose the hidden treasures um, which are the hidden histories of the gypsy traveller. Thank you.